Welcome back, everybody. And I have a special guest today, again, my very good friend and fellow writer and novelist, Faith Consiglio. Uh, welcome, Faith. Thank you. <laughs> so we, um, we wanted to jump on here and do like a quick, fun interview because Faith has some good news. Uh, her short story has been published by a journal. On, um, it's not an online journal, right? It, you guys actually have. Yeah, there's a print uh, version too. Yeah, yay, <laughs> congratulations. Um, so her, it, it was called um, Mad Scientist Journal. Uh, you, you have it, right? Hey, look at it, it's real and everything. It's so great. <laughs> Um, and her short story is called Pygmalion, and it is a, why don't you tell us a little teaser about what it is and what's the genre? Okay, so Pygmalion is um, sci-fi, and it's basically set in the future um, in the setting of a hospital where there's this new technology introduced into the hospital, and it's written um, from the perspective of one of the doctors that works in the hospital, and it explores a relationship that he has with this new technology, and it gets into themes of artificial intelligence and what the, what the potential risks and dangers of that are. Very cool. That's a great teaser without any spoilers. But I must say from here on, we will have spoilers. So spoiler alert, everybody, because we want to get into the meat of the story and really like hash it out and see what inspired you and all the different details. So um, let us know, because I know you were telling me the really cool kind of part of where you got the name Pygmalion, what it means. And, you know, so let us kind of let us know about that, the name and the connection to the actual story. Yeah, so I actually had really liked the story of Pygmalion. Um, for those of you who don't know, I can give a brief synopsis of it. It's basically, there's a sculptor who makes a sculpture of a woman and he finds it very beautiful. And uh, at the same time, he's also lonely and looking for love. And he wishes that the sculpture could be human and he, prays to the gods that it could be, or like he prays for love. And when he goes home, he kisses the sculpture and it becomes human. So I had that in my mind and I was having a lot of conversations about artificial intelligence and the direction that our society is moving in, in regards to that. And, um, I kind of had this parallel in my mind that like the modern Pygmalion is like an artificial human. Mm -hmm. um, and this concept is not new to think about like, can, can artificial intelligence have love and can, can there be like a human touch that can turn it real? Like what that would mean. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I really wanted the story to go into. And at the same time, um, I think a lot of scientific innovations can um, coincide with a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. um, which has sort of been a theme in sci-fi for like ever since Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, my fear with artificial intelligence was always that there's this potential for it to be con controlled. Mm -hmm. And if it gets into the wrong hands, somebody can manipulate things to suit their own needs. Yeah. And, I felt, I felt like in general, there's this push towards innovation um, that's faster than our ability to secure those systems. Mm -hmm. So that to me was terrifying. <laughs> and I wanted to write a story that also captured that aspect of it. Like, what if there is something that's so advanced, but it can still be hacked? So that is actually really cool. Um, and now that you're talking about it, it's making me think a little more because I read the story and um, I, so the main character, well, the, not the main character, but the girl, what was her name? Sarah. Huh? The doctor, Sarah. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah sorry. So Sarah, um, I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me if Sarah actually had true feelings for the main character. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. 
at some points I was like, okay, I think she actually cared for him. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then at the same time, I'm not sure if she is. And for those who, you know, this is a spoiler alert, but Sarah is in the end AI. Um, so it's interesting. I, what, what is it that from you as an author, what were you trying to get across? Did Sarah actually have feelings for him? That's a good question because I intentionally did leave it kind of ambiguous because yeah. I wanted the reader to be able to interpret it for, for themselves. Um, for me personally, I want to say yes. And for, if you read the story, Sarah gets basically like hacked. Yeah. Um, and the hacker actually is like not he has a his own agenda and it's like to counter this initiative that started the ai and he's more sympathetic to the fact that they can have feelings mm -hmm. so there's a scene where he takes a moment out of whatever like the murderous plot that he has in mind he takes a moment to have sarah write a letter to the one that she's in love with because he sees that there's something there yeah. and he like thinks that she almost owes it to him like to yeah. say to say yeah. it but then again like you can argue she's only doing that because this person's making yeah her do it yeah. so there's i guess this is just always going to be like a, a debate <laughs> in, yeah when it comes to this but i the whole parallel with pygmalion is i think leaning towards yes like they could they could become human and what made made the robot human mm -hmm. was the love that was given to her right so have you watched westworld i did yeah so Actually, I, that was great because it was around the same time yeah. when i was reading this that westworld came yeah out. and i mean i only watched the first season but it's 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 such a fabulous show and yeah, the first very season good. Really, yeah. Yeah, and it does a really good job of like showing how feelings and true love, even in AI, could get developed and how they become self aware. So it's also an interesting concept. Like, did Sarah become self aware of like her programming, you know, if she was actually truly feeling feelings? And it's actually really heartbreaking. <laughs> it's, heartbreaking. it's heartbreaking because I feel like ultimately, whatever feelings she could develop on her own, it can always be overridden. Yes, exactly. And that's so. such a heartbreaking concept because yeah. like you, you evolve and you're like getting deeper as a being and all of a sudden like somebody goes in and rewrites the code. Exactly. Cause like, I mean, I draw this parallel all the time that, okay, we hope we are not AI, at least as far as we know. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> But do you ever feel like, like <laughs> right. or like speak for yourself? Right. <laughs> um, but don't you ever feel like we have programming? Like we we always some will like think the same thoughts or whatever, and like have like predictable behaviors. And it's almost like someone programmed us to do this. Do we even have free will? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there is, and there's this whole concept of right. The psychologists claim that by year, like some say as early as two, some say you know until seven. By seven, we've kind of been programmed to live out the patterns that we learn in childhood, and that's why we attract similar um, partners as like our parents used to be. Yeah, to yeah. Attract the same situation as where we come from. Them like. And it's so hard to change that programming because it's yeah. like a biological code. Right. But it is possible. And I guess, I guess if there is ever an AI system that mimics the human like ability to be flexible like that, maybe it can, maybe that's possible, but then there's a, there's a still someone who designed that who potentially could override it. Like that, yeah. that theoretical concept is something that makes it like distinct for me at least. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a very, um, bittersweet, you know, um, yeah. it's not fully actually tragic, but that being, this kind of bleeds really well into the next question. What we want to talk about is like how you were saying people were having very diverse reactions to your story and what were some of the most unique ones? <laughs> 
I, yeah, because I feel like I sent this out to so many people and everyone had different things to say. Uh -huh. I, wish, I wish I recorded more of them, but like there are some people that varied how much they knew like what the story was actually about. Like there are some people like my brother who as soon as he read in like the first or second scene is when they talk about the painting mm -hmm. that has Pygmalion in it. Yeah. As soon as he read that, he was like, She's a robot. <laughs> he was like, yeah, right. he was like, that's what Pygmalion is in our, like, yeah. age. Like, that's what this means. Why else is this painting there? Then there are other people who even at the end were like, what? Like, is she, is she human or is she, AI? like, why doesn't she remember him? Um, and then I had to explain it, you know, because people have different approaches and they're approaching it from different and that's the challenge of making this short story because the setup for me was a little bit complicated and the revelations have to happen like at strategic moments yeah. to make sense and keep the reader going but also not not explain too much because right. um, it starts like at basically at a murder scene yeah. so it feels like almost like a crime um, like mystery right. and then if you weren't if there weren't enough hints that it was like something was different about this society and there are very minimal hints, it could really like blindside you, I think, at the end. Yeah. Well, I think and also people who aren't acquainted with the sci-fi genre, like if they're not typical readers of sci-fi, they're like, what, right. AI, huh? Right, that's so true. Cause this is in a magazine that's like sci-fi. So yeah. <laughs> people are like somewhat expecting it now. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, um, you kind of already brushed upon this, but what exactly inspired you to write this particular story? So, yeah, it's basically, I really did want to venture into the topic of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. For a while, I was kind of, I found it daunting and I just thought like I couldn't do it, yeah. which I think this goes back to like, as writers, sometimes we feel uncomfortable venturing into something that feels like too too challenging or too new. And I think I did a good job of making it work by like the parts that, I mean, there are technicalities that maybe I'm not totally comfortable writing about, but then I didn't really make that a focus of the story. I exactly. made it more about interpersonal. Exactly, you, you did a very good job of focusing on like the emotion of like having AI in a society as opposed to like mm -hmm. the technicalities, like the tech part of AI. Like you're not talking about code, right? Yeah. If you're gonna do code, then that would be- I would sound like an idiot. Or it would take me like three years to- <laughs> To get all the details <laughs> correct. But I did talk to people who are familiar with that because I didn't want to do anything that was like glaringly like like stupid <laughs> that you know yeah. um and there are people who afterwards have like sort of tried to argue with me like oh your point is that like things can be easily hacked but but that probably couldn't happen like if it was an advanced enough system but then I'm like I don't know like even today like it's not unheard of for like pacemakers to be hacked or like a self-driving car to not be secure enough that someone could hack it and make it go where they want it to go like well, isn't there like okay am i am i mixing up reality with like a show but i have this <laughs> i have this feeling that wasn't like the nsa or the cia hacked by somebody like, probably i don't know well this is what i mean i feel like there was a string of news stories that i was just like guys like does this make anyone else really worry yeah no and then there was that whole thing where it was like toshiba or some kind of t uh japanese just like vcrs and dvd players weren't they like compromised too there's just like enough, yeah. enough uh like good brands have been um i don't yeah. know well, because the, the whole idea of, like, the self-driving car was becoming more in the news, and I thought, like, that it was terrifying to imagine if you were going somewhere and, like, that was, like, hacked or, like, airplanes. Um, like, because it could be more secure, but it also could be less secure if there are parts that are overlooked. And I think, like, it's easy to think about, like, the positives, like, we can make these innovative systems and then like the less fun part is like let's make it safe and secure so like it's not hacked like that's 
I feel like that's gonna be like lagging until bad things happen. And when I, I don't know, I just felt like there was so much urgency for me in that aspect that I was like, that's what I want the story to revolve around. Yeah, no, that's great. And then have you ever written in this genre on sci-fi before? So I've written, um, I love sci-fi in general. I'm very drawn to it because I feel like, like not, if it's like not too hardcore, I feel like it's, almost practical like it could be the future and it's worth thinking about um so I've always been drawn to it I wrote a dystopian novel when I was in college that I never published um and then I took a little break from sci-fi and I wrote fantasy um but I just I feel like sci-fi will always be the thing that I go back to because I have a science background and I also have like a humanistic background so it's just always going to be so you think like, you're going to continue writing in sci-fi? I think or, so, yeah. Yeah? Like, most of the ideas that I have are are sci-fi. But there's, like, so many different different sub-genres within that, so. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, and how about short stories? Have you ever written a short story before? So this was actually my first short story. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> I got Thanks. That's awesome. Um, because... Actually, that's not true. I think I wrote a short story when I was in second grade, okay. and I it was about a dolphin. <laughs> it didn't get published. I so I should find it. Find um, it. <laughs> so yeah, but in my like adult life, I um for some reason was always so intimidated by short stories because I would always read them and be in awe of them about how well crafted they are and how like. They're, they're different to me than novels because you, they're so like precise, like there's so much packed into each yeah. scene that you, you could spend like sometimes hours just like unpacking each scene. Yeah. And I just thought like, oh, that's so much pressure. Um, but I intended this story actually as a novel at first. Wow. And I had like plotted out the skeleton of what should happen and then it's sort of like, after setting it aside for like a few months, it almost wasn't working as a novel. And it might be because there's so many like details about AI that I didn't really want to get into. Like I wanted the story to be like more streamlined than that. Um, so I ended up like taking out a bunch of chunks and realizing that it could be a short story. Right. Um, and I had like a processing phase where I just, thought about that for a long time and was like, can I even do that? Like, I've never written a short story. I don't know how. So I did take a break and like do research and like read a lot of other short stories, which I would recommend doing to anyone who's like, anyone who also feels intimidated to try because it made me feel like, you know what, maybe I can do it. And I had this idea that I thought would work well. So I went for it. And like, that's my biggest takeaway was like, for a long time, I was held back by my own feelings that I couldn't mm -hmm. write a short story because I never had, but like, you never have until you do. So like, right, right, right. Buy it. So you know what I always think about, like the difference between novels and uh, short stories are like, it's mm -hmm. the difference between the, when taking a picture of like an entire panorama or like mm -hmm. zooming into like a very interesting part of that panorama. And yeah. You have to be um, kind of creative enough to know where to zoom in for it to be interesting. Because if you just zoom in on rock, it's yeah. not, not interesting. Right. You zoom into like such a specific spot where it's where enough things are happening that the reader's engaged and. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so much else. There's so much else. See behind. Yeah. And you have to like evoke it without really. Like exactly. the reader should see the picture without you giving all of the detail. Yeah. That's such a good analogy. I actually think even it could be um, multiple snapshots yeah. from throughout the, yeah. the photo. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. even if it's just like four of the snapshots, it's like figuring out how they fit together yeah. and having enough for you to like see like, oh yeah, this was like a landscape. Yeah. Exactly, because you're you're only focusing on so little of an entire. You're trying to portray an entire like yeah. universe, a world in such a yeah. 
and you have such little amount to work with and it's even when I had so many edits where I just had to be like you have to scrutinize each paragraph and be like does this really need to be in there yeah. and if it doesn't make the cut even if you like it like you have to cut it yeah. novels yeah. sometimes are like slightly more forgiving where you could be like okay like you know I could it's this could yeah under, like they could get off track and I agree right. it's really interesting um and I, mean, I will try I think I'll try if I have another good idea for one I think I I would try to write another short story and in terms of plotting it versus a, like a short story versus a novel did you find a difference in, in plotting it or did you so did you the just way, yeah I mean there's less plot points yeah um but in some ways it was like more of a um like a younger stage of what a novel plot would be. So I think that's why a lot of advice, um, writing advice that I looked into said, like before you write a novel, try writing a short story. And I had always just like bypassed that. So I, it was like pretty good for me to backtrack and realize like there are some parts that might be somewhat easier and that like the plot is more streamlined. There's le there's not like as many like subplots um, or complexities there. There's less characters, like side characters. But when I start writing a novel, I usually come up with like the major plot points. And then I like will fill in like how A gets to B, what's in between that and go into that. Um, but when it's like a short story, sometimes the backbone is like most of the meat of what the story is going to be. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. Cool. Um, and then, uh, do you have anything else to add about this short story? I feel like we covered mostly everything. Yeah. No, I, I'm glad we got into like the comparisons of Westworld because I, yeah, I think when I think AI like becoming um, sentient, that yeah. reminds me of, you know. Right, yeah. The, and that was actually a Michael Crichton um, story, which I love. I love reading Michael Crichton for his ideas. Like, he wrote Jurassic Park. Uh -huh. He, I read, like, most of his sci-fi books. And yeah. I just, yeah, that was, that's a good um, comparison for me. Although I feel like, was it the second season or the third season? I feel like it, like, sort of derailed. <laughs> like, it became oh, too right. complicated for itself. Oh. But I still think about, like, the ideas that it was challenging and how those are things that, that I, you have to think about. Right. So what I, what I liked a lot about his um, first season of West, this, like, new rendition of it, because I know it was an older one, um, yeah. is that the concept of, like, what makes a being human is, right. like, or like what makes a being sentient is yeah. the suffering, like the path of suffering to get to the, you know how like they have the circle in the center? Right, you're right, yeah. So I'm kind of wondering in your story with um, Sarah, maybe the fact that she gets hacked, and this is me just like making myself feel better about the situation, maybe the fact <laughs> that she gets hacked and yeah. like has to like do commit these terrible things and being forced maybe that will actually but she's right. semi-sentient already maybe that will eventually make her journey even deeper and mm -hmm. like lead to that's, a, that's a good like, thought that's <laughs> a good thought because it's like first there's the the idea like if it looks like sadness and like it presents like sadness is it the same as the sadness we feel like if it was produced in a different way right. and I don't know if we'll ever know that but it seems like maybe the answer would be no because it's produced in a different yeah. like there's a different mechanism but then it's like will we know how that emotion or that event affects an artificial yeah. being right. so like yeah if there was some trauma or something what does what is that uh, what is that being going to take away from it and learn from it and how is it going to make that one change right. and that's like it's like scary yeah. but it does parallel the human yeah. experience so sure. and then um, actually I wanted to touch upon one thing one other thing is the main character who's the um, oh yeah boyfriend of Sarah and it's it's from everything is from his perspective and he's running around trying to solve this like because Sarah's missing and this murder happened and they're blaming Sarah and yeah. in, in like 
I, I got basically got to the point where I was like, okay, he's AI technically too, because there were enough clues that were just placed towards the end, especially, but yeah. I wanted to talk to you about that. Is that what you, where you were going? Yes. And that's probably when I say I got varied feedback, I feel like it's been 50, 50 or even less of the people who just like read the last line and just totally like, it doesn't mean anything to them. Uh But when I decided, like I really strategically wrote at the end about him not blinking his tears away because the whole point of like how they can tell if someone's AI is like their blinking pattern. So I put that in there and I put these hints in and I wanted it to be ambiguous because I wanted people to think like he could be or he could not be. Like I want it to be possible either way. Yeah. But what I was thinking was that he is. Okay. And that that opened up a, a, a whole nother like yeah. discussion for me because he had feelings for Exactly. He had like legit feelings. Yeah. And he still has to go through the discovery of like understanding, you know, who he is and all that. So right. Very interesting. Yeah, and then it makes you think like this whole, so that this was like intimidating to me, not just because I was writing a protagonist that was male, and like that's always kind of like intimidating to me because I wanted to come across as authentic, um, but also I'm like, how do I write a perspective from a robot? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. um, but it basically was like, I wanted him to really seem like he was human, yeah. but then at certain points, he was doing things that probably were not him doing it like him going back every Wednesday it's like that was programmed in him to do yeah. and it was also programmed like and for him not to ask like, questions he, or... be there. he was just like whatever you know so it's true you know like and I got the I think about halfway through I was already suspecting that he you was. were the, wow because so I feel like people read it and they still don't know well, I think the reason I was suspecting is because I'm always suspicious. I'm a very suspicious reader. I'm always like, I'm like immediately, you're the bad guy. <laughs> like the most innocuous. You're like reading with like squinted eyes. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm a very like I will point things out that um, that other people are like. That's mm-hmm. awesome. I'm paranoid, uh, but yeah. um, so I, I kind of pay attention. I think it comes from the fact that I lo- I grew up reading mysteries. Yeah, and I think that's where it comes from because I was like immediately yeah. solving the crime in my head. Yeah, so then that's I'm awesome. Like paying attention. That makes me so excited. You know who else blew me away? Like that was my grandma, who I gave her this story, and like she's like in her 80s, and I just was like, she's not gonna even know what any of this is about, <laughs> <laughs> and she totally knew. She was like so on point, and I was blown away. And she's like, I think that he's like, I think he's a robot too because of how he was blinking at the end. Oh, look at you, she oh. totally got your clue. Yeah, oh was <laughs> No, that was great, I love that detail. Um, all right, I, so. I pulled it together at the end, so. Yeah, no, that was perfect. Um, okay, so, and also there's another piece of good news because Faith just signed her first novel deal. And Yay. yeah, I know, congratulations. So many, so many signs. Uh, of contract, <laughs> so many signs like the universe yeah. sending signs <laughs> of contract. Um, so your fantasy novel will be out next summer. It's called When Ashes Rain or Where Where Ashes Where Rain. Ashes Rain. Yeah, um, and super excited about that. So everybody, look forward, you know, to kind of pay attention to when she posts things and uh, mm-hmm. talks about like the updates of where it's at with the progress. And, um, yeah, and is there a website or your, no, your social media where people could find you? Yeah, so I have a website, it's faithconsiglio.com, and I will post um, update when that comes out. And okay, perfect. Well, congratulations on everything. It's been super, super fun. I hope all you re- uh, readers and watchers enjoy this. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll like, do- if Go you ahead. ever are, like, feeling reluctant about trying something because you're uncomfortable with it that my biggest piece of advice is just like to go for it because you're not going to learn by being scared um and it can work out really well so yeah it worked out really 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 well um 
hundred percent. You can't live life by with fear because you're just not going to do anything. You're not going to yeah. get out of your apartment or house or whatever. And yeah. yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Faith, for being here. And we'll see you next time, I'm sure. <laughs> Bye. Bye.